So the marketing people are the marketing people figure out what needs to be done, and then the advertising people take that and they turn it into something creative in order to execute that. Essentially. Okay. Well, I would hope that that's the case. But from my 25 years of interacting with big uh, marketing firms, big brands, uh, the marketers are just scrambling to, you know, run <laughs> programs. They are not. They are not doing enough to understand their customer. I mean, if they were, they wouldn't hire a social media agency to do all their social media for them. I mean, yeah. every single marketer should be spending all day long on social media, interacting with customers, understanding what their gripes are, what their needs are, and what, you know, that would be the way to do marketing, right? If you were actually doing it that way, listening to your customers, because digital is two way, you have a feedback loop. I don't see many marketers doing that. They just outsource social media. They just outsource all this stuff to their agencies. And the agencies aren't doing that because they want to spend the least amount of time, use the lowest cost resource so they can maximize their profit for Wall Street. Morning. Hey, what's going on? Hey, man. Very good. How's your... Uh... You got your MRI stuff this morning? Yes, yes. Um, right. I pretty, I pretty much made a, the correct diagnosis. So uh, okay. ACL is, yeah, the ACL is torn, which is like oh. the ligament that um, connects the, the your your femur and your tibia, and the okay. meniscus, a crack in the meniscus to tear. So okay. yeah, <laughs> there's still a little more to to go. Okay. Yeah. Well, hopefully yeah, all that. require surgery. Okay. You're uh, you you uh, are a skater, is that uh, or a skateboarder? Is that how um, you heard it? Yeah, a, a tricker. So I do oh. I do um, yeah okay. crazy flip crazy flips in the air oh, and kicks okay. and uh, stuff like that. Okay, well, all right. I'm you know glad you're on the mend and and getting better. So that's cheers. That's right. <laughs> I appreciate that. Yo, your yeah. video is off, man. I can't see. Oh, it. okay. Sorry. Um, okay. Here we go. There we go. Howdy. Perfect. What's going on? Not too much. Not too much. Glad to <laughs> be chatting with you. Um, <laughs> Likewise, same here. Yeah. All right. I've got the uh, whole hour set aside for you. So uh, if, if you need to take the whole hour, feel free to do that. Yeah. All right. Let's get cracking. Um, so I think a good place to start is um, a quick little intro on uh, who you are, uh, what your background is. Super fascinating because you actually come from a technical background and then uh, you transition into marketing. So, um, yeah, if you don't mind uh, introducing yourself really quickly. Sure. I'm Augustin Fu. Um, I'm a digital marketer of 25 years. Uh, I kind of sit right in at the intersection between the technical side and the analytics side and the marketing. And I think digital is a, is a great example of that, where you really have to understand some of the technology to, to then do better marketing, right? Uh, so... Right now, I, I consider myself an analytics person, right? I, I really like looking at data. And if I can't support a hypothesis uh, with data, then you know I can't run with it, right? So in marketing, I tend to do a lot of experiments, right? I'm a scientist by training. So I got my PhD from MIT a long time ago in chemical engineering. So it's really not related to what I do these days, but I think of it as the scientific method, right? Applied to marketing. So I try to run experiments, test hypotheses, and digital is a great medium for that because we have a feedback loop, right? We get click-through rates. We get to see how people responded. Did they search for an item more than they did before? So we have kind of um, the feedback loops that we never had in traditional channels, which were typically one way, right? TV is one way print is one way you send the message out there and then you hope, right? You hope people respond to it or see it, but in digital uh, it's a great media uh, where we have feedback loops. And those are the types of data and analytics that I look at to see if the marketing's working. Yeah, that's, that's absolutely fascinating. One of the most difficult things when I, when I'm having this conversation is always deciding uh, where to take it because there are like, you know, 20 different places that you mentioned, which are super interesting, but like really quickly, what was chemical engineering like? Because that, that sounds also, that sounds really cool. Well, in that department, it's called the material science and engineering department, uh, which is different than chemistry and different mm -hmm. than chemical engineering. So uh, chemistry and chemical engineering typically means they make the materials. So I was more on the applied side. So we were studying organic uh, light emitting diodes. So you call them OLEDs, right? You might have seen Sony has TVs that have OLEDs and LG makes the OLED panels. 
But those were the types of materials that I was studying more than 25 years ago. Uh, basically, it's thin films of organic materials that give off light when you put an electric field across it. And back then, we were sure. trying to figure out how to stabilize it so it can operate for long periods of time, how to increase the brightness of the light, and also how to tune the color. So all of that now you actually see in consumer products, right? But that was uh, back then I was working on that in the lab. Uh, I, I, and it was fascinating making the materials, yeah. That's so incredibly cool. I feel like, you know, just one tiny little deviation or like one tiny little curveball down your path and you would have been like a startup founder instead of a marketer, I feel like. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> super cool, man. Wow, super interesting. I, I can also understand why... Um, uh, digital marketing and analytics uh, specifically um, appeals to you. I, ca I can imagine because, you know, it, when you're talking about, you have a very precise problem and uh, very structured. You have a way of doing experimentations, um, seeing what works, seeing clearly what doesn't work, replication, all of that good stuff. Yeah. I think, um, you know, that's, that's how I kind of fell into or fell in love with digital, right? We have the data that we really didn't have before. And it can be precise, but really one of the key issues is knowing what data is reliable and what data is not, right? So some of the, the, the other reason I got into the fraud side of it was that there's a lot of unreliable data being generated by bots, right? So if yeah. bots are clicking on your ads, then you might have a very high click-through rate. That doesn't mean that your marketing is doing well. It just means that a lot of fraudsters are eating up your budget and clicking on your ads, Right. So yeah. you, you really have to have ways of double checking, right, to make sure that the data is reliable, hasn't been tampered with and things like that. So that's also a natural extension of why I got into the fraud side of things, because in digital, it's very easy for the bad guys to fake a lot of things to make it appear to be performing when it's not actually not. Yeah. All right. Let's go all the way back to the basics. Um in, 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 in your opinion, how should we think about marketing? Let's, let's first take it all the way back to the de definition of marketing. So to me, marketing is not uh, forcing a consumer or a human to see your ad and trying to beat them over the head and say, you know, our thing is the best ever, right? I really think that consumers, modern consumers are too smart for that. Uh, they're also enabled or empowered with so much information, right? So if a marketer or an advertiser is claiming their product is so awesome, the next minute uh, they can actually just ask someone else on Instagram or ask their circle of friends, you know, is it actually that awesome, right? And then yeah. they'll, they'll figure out very quickly that it's not. So for me, doing good digital marketing is very similar to doing good marketing because all the same principles still hold true, right? It's not anything different in digital. Um, so the way I think about advertising and marketing is presenting some information to a user so that they can make their own informed choice, right? So yeah. these days, uh, we're just sending out so many ads to the point where humans are so pissed off at that. There's just too much volume, right? So that's why humans are using ad blockers. But I think if you think about display ads versus search ads, um, to me, I came out of search marketing and to mm -hmm. me, I still it's a better way to go because when the person is actually searching for something and they even tell you what they're searching for uh, because they type in the search term, that's the ideal time to get an ad in front of them, right? So whether yeah. it's a small little snippet of information that's contained in the search ad, which then leads to a little bit more information like content on your site, content on your Instagram page or whatever, all of yeah. those are presented to the consumer to help them along their customer journey, if you will, right? Because they need to find out bits of information so they can decide whether they want to buy your product or not. I actually, I actually read your paper. Um, you'll have to forgive me because I'm, I'm blanking on the name, but I believe it was something with um, the a missing link marketing, if I, yes, if I remember it. Exactly right. Yeah. yeah. So to me, um, you know, customer journeys are complex. And I mm -hmm. think there's over the last decade or so, I've seen a lot of kind of university professors and, and people who teach digital marketing uh, and even the clients. I know J&J, for example, they, they all went all in on customer journey and things like that. So that's right in the sense that you should focus on what it takes to get a customer to the purchase. However, we have to assume that we can't see the full journey. The reason yeah. for that is consumers, I mean, you will only get to see parts of the journey. So for example, when they come to your site, we see those actions that occur on our site. 
when they do a search for your particular products, we see a little bit of that. But there's lots of other parts of that customer journey that we don't get to see. So it's really, really hard to try to put together a complete view of a customer journey. Now, the point of missing links is that we don't have to. Okay, so while we're still focused on the consumer's needs, like what bits of information they need, I just call those missing links because think of um, a chain, right? Um, you have all these different links that are linked together. If any one link is missing, uh, then the entire chain is broken, right? So the chain is an analogy for the customer journey. If they're missing a bit of information, they simply can't get to the purchase, right? They can't get to the end of that. So yeah. our job as marketers is not to just shout at them and say, you know, here's all these marketing messages. Here's how great we think our product is. It's really to sit and listen to the missing links that they have. What are the bits of information that they're looking for so they, they can inform their own customer journey, right? The reason I emphasize their own customer journey is that every customer has a different journey. And I'm going to yeah. use a, a simple example to illustrate. So cars, right? You would think it's a big ticket item, complex product, and people typically do a lot of research before they buy a complex or very expensive product. However, in automobiles, it's actually a little bit different, right? In some cases, people just buy the BMW because their parents bought a BMW and Great their grandparents point. bought a BMW, right? So they don't even have to think about it, right? So yeah. that's just to illustrate that while there are general rules, like the bigger ticket, the item, the more research people tend to do, right? Or the smaller ticket item, like a soda or soup, a uh, can of soup, people don't tend to do a lot of research. So those are kind of generalized principles but there are exceptions to it. So what I kind of developed over the years uh, is now called missing link marketing, which is understanding the bits of information, the missing links that the customer has in their own journey. And if we're able to efficiently fulfill those, right, help them connect those links by giving them the right bits of information, they can then make their own way through the, the purchase journey, right, to the purchase, right? Whatever bits of information they need, we're here to provide them. So you can kind of see how that tees up content marketing, right? Because yeah. a lot of times I see advertisers just spending so much money on ads, but then when someone clicks on an ad and comes to their site, there's nothing useful there, right? So if that happens, then the customer, you've probably lost that customer forever, right? Because they say, well, I just got to the site and there's nothing here for me, right? It doesn't help me at all. They might do another search and then end up on your competitor site who has better content, better reviews, you know, and then they may end up buying your competitor's product. So that's a lot in there, but basically that's kind of the theory behind missing links. We can observe yeah. the missing links and we can help answer them and therefore help get the customer through to the purchase as efficiently as possible. Yeah, what I like uh, about your work is um, how the practicality of all of it, you know, um, because if you look at uh, the, um, the marketing theory that, that comes from the literature, um, Obviously, a lot of research is um, has been done for big firms. But if you look at the the, the ideas that you've shared, a lot of these ideas um, we've seen those for the last you know let's say fifteen years or something um, in uh, you know the SMB space where you have this idea of funnels and it's there's this idea of a landing page and getting yeah. a person to a landing page and content. As you said, you know it's. Uh, I think I think it would be fair to say that that's something that probably originated more on the part of like the small time founders versus like the yes. big firms. You know, their their adoption uh, with respect to those those ideas is uh, a little bit on the later side. Um, I, yeah, I, there's, a, there's a huge difference because for me, you know, I've been a small business owner as well. So everything I know, I've learned on my own. Right. Sometimes the hard way. So I've done my own Google Analytics. I've done my own AdWords. And if you think about it for a small business, um, if they spend $100 in digital marketing and they don't get a return, they That's can't the problem. To spend the next $100. Whereas yeah. for the large brands, right, you can see a P&G could spend $2, uh, sorry, $2 billion. Uh, that's, in that's, not even, that's not even coffee and, for the employees. <laughs> yeah. And, and basically they could lose it all and not matter. Right. And very often... <laughs> Um, you know, for the big advertisers, you know, say, for example, P&G, right, they, they sell in grocery stores, they sell at Walmart. So even if none of the digital marketing actually drove any sales, they really couldn't tell anyway, right? Because a lot of times I call it correlation, not causation, right? Mm -hmm. So they were doing digital marketing at the same time that the sales were happening, but it doesn't mean that the digital marketing caused the sales, 
Yeah. And one yeah. Data point we had in recent years is when they turned off 10% of their digital spend. So they turned off $200 million of digital. They saw no change in sales. So yeah. Literally. So, you know, but too few of the large advertisers are willing to run those kind of experiments to see more clearly for themselves. Yeah. It's, it, it's, it's, it's wet streets cause rain. <laughs> yes, exactly. Right. Yeah. Uh, and this uh, this funny website called Spurious Correlations. Uh, I, I know it. I know it. it. Right, but it's like um, Nicholas he, Cage started more movies, Yeah, <laughs> yes, and then, exactly. uh, there are more pool uh, deaths by drowning in the pool or something. Right, so those curves look the same, but it doesn't mean it caused it. Yeah. So it's just exactly. really funny how that basic principle is not well understood by a lot of marketers, especially the younger ones these days. Oh my God, you are you are one hundred percent right. So. Um... I, I, there are a few products that uh, uh, that I offer in uh, in Youngling Research, and uh, one of them is is a, a membership. It's called YRC Deep, and it's kind of um, uh, it's kind of the equivalent for if you want to learn how to fight, then you go you, you get an MMA gym membership, and this is for your uh, market. <laughs> this is for yeah. marketing professionals. If you want to yeah. be a better marketer, a better entrepreneur, um, you know, hopefully you'll get a, a, a YRC Deep membership. And um, one of the things that that um, we are going to cover actually is, is statistics and you, uh, you don't need a, a PhD or even a bachelor's, but just like a rudimentary understanding. So right now, for example, we're covering uh, introduction to psychological science because I'm of the opinion that marketing is, is, is an area where you're dealing with human beings. So it I makes agree. sense. Yeah, it makes sense to have a rough understanding uh, yeah. of, of human behavior and uh, how the mind works and all of that stuff. And you, you don't need to be an expert, but just at least uh, have touched upon it. Because most people's um, understanding of psychology consists of uh, scrolling Twitter and seeing the, the for the 715 time the survivorship bias picture, the, the player playing with the red dots, or yeah. or the the the, the uh, 200 and 31st uh, thread on cognitive biases, and that's that's the extent of the psychological knowledge. So a yeah. little bit of a grounding in psychology. And one of the things that uh, we went over in the last lecture actually were the the theories from uh, Freud and Skinner, so uh, Fro uh, Freudian theory and um, uh, behaviorism. And there's a lot of stuff that we threw away and there's some, some of the stuff that we kept. But what's interesting there is um, how um, thinking can lead you astray if you don't test. Because the, the main problems yes. with uh, both of these ideas were that they, were, they weren't falsifiable. So Freud yeah. always had like, you know, interesting, um, I, I don't want to turn this into a, a talk about Freudian um, uh, theory, but yeah, he, he always had like a gotcha, you know, he could always make a proposition uh, true if he said like, you know, you, you have an obsession with this, you know, with uh, sex, blah, blah, blah. He could, he could always uh, uh, talk in such a way that the, that the proposition became true. And the same yeah. thing with behaviorism, they, they would just invent a stimuli. They would say, oh, yeah. that, that, that very complicated behavior. Yeah. And it's, I think it's interesting to learn about that and important for my students um, because we're, we, we are often doing the same thing in marketing where we, we decide that something is true and then using you know, uh, uh, smart rationalizations, we, can, we yeah. can ex post facto make it true. Exactly like you said, sales go up, digital marketing, therefore, you know, causal yeah. connection. Um, yeah, and, and basically we, we can cherry pick the data, right? Because there's a lot of data <laughs> in digital. So we just cherry pick the data that supports our hypotheses, right? Exactly collect everything and then exactly yeah. it takes a lot of courage to actually run those experiments and actually see that your hypothesis was wrong right your hypothesis was wrong and then make adjustments yeah. so i think along those lines let me share something else you may have heard of this series it's called brain games um i think it's available on some episodes are available on netflix and, and then also on apple uh, but basically brain games talk that they have brain scientists who understand how the brain works. And I'll okay. just use an example to illustrate here because it's pertinent to advertising. Um, they run experiments. So they have street performers and these, uh, these scientists go out and actually run experiments uh, with people on the street. So, you know, if you think about a card trick or you think about those magicians that steal your watch right off your hand, uh, basically one of the things that they're saying is that, depending on where that person's attention is focused, right? It can be literally looking one foot to the right and they'll miss you stealing your, their watch off their arm, right? Yeah. So it applies to say TV advertising, right? If they're not paying attention to the screen or digital advertising, right? If they're looking at the content on the page and not the ad on the right-hand side, even if the ad showed up on the page, if you ask them later, they won't recall seeing it because yeah. their eyes were literally not focused on that. 
So I, I thought that was very interesting in terms of understanding how the brain works, understanding human motivation, uh, and also just little simple things and principles could be applied to marketing, whether it's TV advertising or banner ads or, or things like that. So it's called um, brain games. It's just fun to watch because it's all experiments and they kind of explain the, you know, uh, how the brain works and why we lead, we see these observations. So I thought awesome. Awesome. I'll, I'll put it in the, um, in the description, make sure to include it. And uh, I'm going to add it to my, uh, to my watch list. Excited. Um, all right. Um, okay. There are a few areas that I, I want to get into. Um, always have to pick and choose. Um, okay. I'm going to cover, I, I'm going to ask you about this first. Uh, you wrote something um, with respect to the four P's um, and that, that in your opinion, that um, it, it, it's time to, to move past that. Can you elaborate a little bit on that? Um, by the way, maybe give a, a quick introduction for the, of the four P's for the, the two people who might not, uh, who might've okay. forgotten. <laughs> um, well, basically that piece uh, from about a year ago, I was just railing against the four P's because it was a framework that is often cited by academics but very uh, seldom practice in reality. Now, I, I'll give you an example. This was literally a conversation I had yesterday. My friend uh, from McKinsey, he was actually doing a market sizing uh, exercise for a client, and he was actually using four Ps. But I said, that's great. You know, there are certain uh, rare cases when a, st a strategy consultant is actually using four Ps as a structured framework to look at different aspects, right? Pricing, product, and things like that and figure out you know, do, what changes we need to make to uh, approach the market right, or do a turnaround for a particular company. But I would have to say that in my 25 years of doing digital strategy, when you go in to talk to marketers at big advertisers, uh, they know about the framework, but they're not mm -hmm. using it in everyday life. right? And mm -hmm. it's just because they're always uh, running at full speed. They're trying to keep, stay above water they don't have the luxury of time to step back and, oh, let's just think theoretically with the four Ps and see where we're going with this. The other yeah. thing is in large corporations, there's so many departments that a marketer or an advertiser um, is really there to execute, right? So they've been given a budget. They now work with the agencies and literally just execute on those plans. They, they're not spending time uh, thinking about strategy. And even if they did, right? it's not like their strategy is going to get implemented. So I just think yeah. in reality, too few of the marketers are using that every day. So the point of my article back then is I was having a big debate with two academics. I won't name them, but basically they're saying, Oh, you can't abandon these old frameworks. But I said, uh, it's pretty much not in use anymore. It's a nice theoretical framework to think about things on a corporate retreat when you have the time. Right. So you know, early in my career, when we had corporate retreats at McKinsey or at the clients, we would have the time set aside an entire day to brainstorm and talk about four Ps and that kind of stuff to think strategically. But very often marketers in their day-to-day -day jobs, you know, they're just barely staying above water. They're not yeah. thinking about four Ps and doing the theoretical stuff like that. Yeah, I can, I can uh, 100% see where you're coming from. Um, Personally, I, I am a, a, a modest fan uh, of the four piece, um, also with my students, um, because there's like there's kind of roughly if maybe like a 30, 30, 30 or 33, 33, 33 split uh, in the people who are uh, in YRC um, bootstrappers, people who run a, a, a bigger, a bigger company and then uh, marketing professionals. But uh, if you're if if you have the control, which you do if you're a bootstrapper, um, then I think it's useful because um, I I always list the four P's as um, product price, th those two together, um, uh, place promotion, and yes. pro product is first. And I and what I like about that yes. if you list it this way because everyone listed in its own ways, it's, it's it's my pet peeve <laughs> if listing yeah. it in a, out of order. But but that tells you okay, start with um, the product. And the product is a function, if you're consumer oriented, um, of what customers want. So that automatically nudges you towards market orientation, towards yes. um, the, uh, yes. uh, qualitative research, ethnography, what have you, which is exactly how we start versus in, in, in uh, the bootstrapping neck, neck of the woods, the startup scene, where it's oftentimes, you know, you, you uh, use your brilliance to create, to craft a product. 
and then you know you procrastinate and perfectionism and yeah. and will it will it ever get done i hope so and if yeah. you somehow make it through that hunger game so you end up with a finished product now you seek out the marketers and it's like hey i made this using my brilliance yeah. now go get customers yeah. so what i like about this is that it reverses it um and also pricing um and, and again i i, I want to emphasize um these four p's for us at least it's um it's it's something that you do like it's a it's a quick and dirty heuristic you know so it's not like spend yeah. years on this but but yeah at least like give it a little bit of thought with pricing are you going to go low are you going to go high are you how are you going to position it um you know place uh promotion what what's the idea there so just so, something that like can yeah. inform you and guide your 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 thinking totally right totally right i mean basically if the academics didn't oversell it i'd be okay with it but they totally oversold That's it fair. Uh, but That's bottom line fair. Yes, the practical thing and yes you should if you have time you should use it to structure your thinking and i think in class environment or for a startup uh, founder it's a it's a great way to do structured thinking, right? So instead of just thinking all over the place and randomly, it helps you structure. And I, I'm going to kind of re-echo what you just said in terms of the order of the four Ps because I agree with it. So product has to come first, right? If your product sucks and it's undifferentiated, none of the other Ps will matter, right? So yeah. I, I look at, you know, when I was serving the large uh, financial services, if you think about MasterCard, Visa, and American Express, I actually ran this in class. I said uh, to my students, just tell me what's different about these three things, MasterCard, Visa, American Express. They could not yeah. articulate any difference. The, lo the logo. <laughs> right? Okay, yeah, the, the logo. logo, right? The color of the logo. <laughs> the, the distinctive so, assets. <laughs> so in <laughs> those cases, when the products are undifferentiated, um, you shouldn't be spending on marketing because it's useless. You can't, you know, uh, differentiate your product through marketing. Now, some will argue, oh, well, MasterCard has Peyton Manning. So, you know, some people will say, oh, it's different because it's associated with Peyton Manning, but there's, it's not an inherent feature of the product, right? So mm -hmm. that only lasts a certain period of time, right? For as long as MasterCard keeps paying Peyton Manning to be on their TV ads. After that, mm -hmm. comes out, then it doesn't work anymore. So product has to come first. And to me, price, as you said, is related to product because there's a certain value that the person, that the potential customer sees in the product. Exactly. The price is set exactly. higher than the perceived value, they won't buy it. But if the price is set lower than their perceived value, then they will buy it, right? So price exactly. has entirely to do with uh, what value and what features the potential customer sees in your product. Which, then, which, can, which can also be influenced as a function of price, because when you increase the price, you also increase the, increase the perceived value. Yeah, when you increase your product, right? When you, when you innovate your product and make it better, yeah. Um, and yes, then, yeah. Yeah. yes but, I, but, I, but I also believe uh, all else being equal, that if you increase the price, customers sometimes use that as a heuristic. So they, they use that as a, as a way of determining that the product itself must be better. So if you have, to, if you have two uh, uh, cans of salt, uh, and one is, is is twice as expensive or maybe 50 50% 50 more expensive and you're in system one uh, reasoning you see yes. that you're like ah oh, let me just grab this one it, it, it's probably fine so then it's like a that's actually yeah, it's a it's a great way of differentiating customers so i like to say this like there's vanilla and there's tahitian vanilla which <laughs> yes. is more right? <laughs> Which do you think is more valuable? So, um, you know, I think there's one company that markets it in a nice brown bottle with calligraphy and it's Tahitian vanilla. It's Madagascar exactly. vanilla, right? So that's definitely more pricey than the um, than the vanilla you get off the shelf in a grocery store. <laughs> yes. So I've seen those before. Um, but let me just finish the, the last two piece. Place Please. for me um, is no longer as relevant because you can get everything off of Amazon, right? So that was one point I made in the article that place is not as important as it used to be because in the old world in the offline world if the product were physically not near you right you couldn't drive to a store to buy it you literally could not buy it but these days with e-commerce and with all the dtc brands right you just on you go to their website and buy it so yeah. i had an experience last night i mean we got a gift of some chocolates and they were for chinese or lunar new year and these were little chocolate tigers right just a tiny little box just highly specialized. And I had never seen the brand before, but within a minute, we tried the chocolates. And then within five minutes, we bought some for friends, right? We went to their website and made some orders, right? And in yeah. fact, my wife ordered five of them for different friends. So that was an example where we didn't even know the brand existed, 
but because we got a gift from someone and we really liked it and we thought, oh, this is pretty special. We hadn't seen it before. We made six purchases within 15 minutes of a brand yeah. that we never, and it was super expensive chocolate for what it was, right? But it was very special. So that's an example where place now no longer as matters as much as it used to be, right? As long as you can make it available for the customers. And then finally, uh, promotion, right? That should be the absolute last P because if everything else works, right? If your product is awesome, now you have social media. Now you have word of mouth. People will tell their friends or they would buy it as a gift for the friends. You don't need yeah. promote, right? Uh, it will automatically sell itself. So a lot of times, um, you know, it's, it, I see advertisers and young marketers do the exact opposite, right? So they'll, they'll yeah. throw all of their money at promotion. Okay, your product sucks. And yeah. you know, there's tons of bad reviews. Nobody's going to buy it, no matter how much advertising you do, right? So I think the order, the specific order that you said, I 100% agree with. It has to be in that hierarchy, right? Product first, then price, then place, then um, promotion. Promotion. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, exactly. Um, I think you're spot on. Um, there's, oh, by the way, Bill Burnbeck, he made a similar remark. He said something uh, along the lines of uh, good advertising won't uh, save a crappy product. It, it'll yeah. uh, make it feel faster because, you know, it, it gets <laughs> yeah. exposed to more people. Yeah. Um, does, does, does this uh, argument also imply that you disagree with uh, the, the thesis that um, marketing can create demand? So if, you're go, if you go heavy on uh, promotion, even if the product is eh, a little bit iffy, then still, you know, the, because of like psychological reasons, et cetera, you know, you see uh, a, a lot of proof of commitment and all of that stuff in terms of ad budget. So it makes people go like, oh, I guess there's something here. Yes. Or do you uh, think no, I, that, I will, that's pseudoscience? I will, emph I will emphasize marketing and advertising does not create demand okay. okay it helps satisfy demand okay so let me there's a nuance there so the the example i use in class is uh milk okay so no matter how much milk advertising from the milk council a person is exposed to they can't physically drink more that family or that household can't physically drink more than four quarts of milk per week so no matter how much advertising they see, they're not going to buy a fifth quart of milk for the week because they can't use it. Okay. That's what I mean by advertising does not create demand. However, if there is demand, right? So they want, they need to drink four quarts of milk per week. Advertising satisfies the demand by uh, showing them which brands or op products are available to them, which options they can buy, right? So between two different products that would satisfy the demand, they are now aware of, okay, here's product A, here's product B. And then advertising makes them aware. Modern consumers are going to go research it a little bit more and then decide whether to buy product A or product B that satisfies the demand that they have. Now, a lot of times people will use the Apple argument. Oh, people didn't know they needed an iPhone before. Okay, that yeah. is, that's an example, but it's not an example of where they created demand. Okay, so it created a new category. Uh, because phones, you know, handheld, small mobile phones didn't exist before. And in, in the case of Apple, um, they had unique value proposition at the time. So some of the early Apple products were tied to music, right? So iPod and things like that. Um, you know, Napster came along before Apple released Apple Music. But the people who were downloading, you know, pirated music through Napster were not the same people who used Apple products, right? So the mm. mainstream consumer finally got into downloading music because it was all fully integrated into the product, right? When Apple came out with the iPod, they also came out with iTunes, which has the music. So for mainstream people who were not hackers and who were not people using Napster to download music illegal, illegally, uh, that, that is what brought downloaded music to the mainstream. So to me, it really wasn't an example of where advertising alone created demand, right? You have to have a viable product. People have to realize, oh, I could use that. You know, I, you know, the demand is there, but now it was a difference between choosing to buy the Apple iPhone versus an Android or whatever else phone was out there at the time. So do you see the difference between creating demand versus yeah. satisfying demand with one brand over another? 
Yes, 100%. Um, in the future, I want to hold uh, small marketing roundtables and get like uh, three or four people on and then uh, have a conversation around a, a specific topic. And I think uh, this specifically would be an interesting topic because Rory Sutherland, for example, I know that uh, he is actually of the opinion that um, it is possible to teach people how to want something. So, um, you know, the, 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 yeah, I, I think get you know, I would agree that um, we can inspire people, right? Oh, I never thought of buying roses for Valentine's before. And so there are di- or the diamond engagement ring with uh, yeah, things the like beer. So and, there are some, yeah. certain cases where you can kind of say people were simply not aware. They didn't think of that as an option. Right. But uh, basically, I think the beers did a great job, you know, kind of signaling that that was the thing you buy to, you know, for engagements, right? So yeah, there are certain cases in history where you could you could see, but again, those were more like creating new categories that just didn't exist before, right? As opposed mm-hmm. to uh, creating demand. Now, let me go yeah. back to the chocolate example, right? So over the years, I've seen many different high end chocolates, right? So here in New York, you had Bosch, you had Jacques Torres. Um, there's also Mary Bell. Uh, and then more recently, there's Lauderock. And then this particular one, Burdick chocolate, never heard of before, right? But people, you know, uh, for example, Jacques Torres, they, he had a huge following uh, for a number of years, but now it's fallen off because it's so ubiquitous that it's not special anymore. So if you think about gift giving, right, are you going to give Jacques Torres chocolate or are you going to give the Burdick chocolates where, you know, we had the little tiger shaped chocolates, right, that we bought yeah. yesterday, right? So there's always kind of this evolution and people are going to want, you know, for a special gift, they're going to want a something that's more unique, that's rare. People haven't seen that before. Um, so I think that would be a case study where if Burdick Chocolate did advertising, people would see, oh, that's new and special, right? They would buy that over alternative chocolates like Lauderach, like uh, Jacques Therese or, or Bosch or things like that. So that's where advertising helps Burdick win the demand, right? So now people yeah. choose to buy their chocolate versus all the other chocolate alternatives. So I think that's where I, that's what I mean by satisfying the demand. There is yeah. the demand. They want chocolate. They want to buy a gift. Which chocolate do you buy? So if Burdick had the right advertising and the right content behind it, then they would choose the Burdick one versus the other ones. Yeah, I, I 100% understand where you're coming from. Uh, a, 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 a way uh, of, 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 of thinking about this idea would be that, you know, no amount of marketing is going to get people to eat dog food. You know, people don't want to <laughs> yeah, eat dog be- food. And exactly, yeah. exactly. And, yeah. and if that were possible, then you could create an, a, a smart campaign in order to get people to eat dog food. But it, it's, yeah. it's just not going to happen. Yeah. yeah, I think, um, yeah, that's very interesting. Um, there are a few more um, topics that I want to touch, but um, very quickly, I want to um, ask you a question. Um, how should we um, separate marketing and advertising? How should we think about that? Because sometimes when you talk to people, um, you get kind of like these these fuzzy definitions where it's like, it, it starts to become interchangeable. So I'm, I'm curious to hear how you think about that. I, I'm actually one of those people. Um, to okay. me, <laughs> I'm a, I mean, basically advertising is what I t- typically would refer to TV ads or print ads or radio ads, because they tend to be one way. Um, I use advertising and marketing interchangeably in digital because, you know, some people call it digital marketing, but it's basically just banner ads or video ads or whatever, right? So I, I do use it interchangeably. I don't really see the difference. Now, if you really wanted to be academic about it, right, ads are the ads themselves. Marketing tends to be lower in the funnel. Uh, so search ads, so I'm already mixing it up, right? Search ads, <laughs> where people are searching for something, right? So they're in consideration phase. So when they're looking for further information, you present a search ad. Uh, so to me, I don't really differentiate, unless you have a way to differentiate the two, I, I think of them pretty interchangeably. Yeah, uh, yeah, I, I see where you're coming from. Yeah, I, I like to think of it um, in the ways of Dave Trott, where it's like, okay, marketing is like the reasoning process, figuring out what the customer actually wants and all of that good stuff, who the customer is even. And then advertising is the creative expression of all of that. So uh, Dave Trott, uh, he always says, advertising is the voice of marketing. So the marketing, people are, the marketing people figure out what needs to be done. And then the advertising people take that and they turn it into something creative in order to execute that essentially. Okay, well, I would hope that that's the case, but- but from my 25 years of interacting with big uh, marketing firms, big brands, uh, the marketers are just scrambling to 
you know, run programs. They are not, they're not doing enough to understand their customer. I mean, if they were, they wouldn't hire a social media agency to do all their social media for them. I mean, yeah. every single marketer should be spending all day long on social media, interacting with customers, understanding what their gripes are, what their needs are, and what, you know, that would be the way to do marketing, right? If you were actually doing it that way, listening to your customers, because digital is two way, you have a feedback loop. I don't see many marketers doing that. They just outsource social media. They just outsource all this stuff to their agencies. And the agencies aren't doing that because they want to spend the least amount of time, use the lowest cost resource so they can maximize their profit for Wall Street, right? Has, yeah. you know, they're not doing a good job on listening to customers. And then they hire these focus group companies to go talk to people, right? I was at a big brand. We did focus groups. And all the people who came to the focus groups were there for the $300 stipend and the free dinner. They were not, th they would tell you whatever you wanted to hear. So yeah, when we asked that's them, common. You know, this product or that product, what are we going to actually get from that? You would be, you would do yourself better to just look at the search terms people are typing in on your own website, right? Some websites don't even have search on their site. Some websites don't even log the search terms. That's a source of information. That's a source of insights about when your customer, get, when a prospective customer comes to your website, and they can't find what they're looking for. They they search for something, right? You should log all of that, right? You should track all of that so you understand what are the things that they're looking for, what are the things they're asking about, right? I would you'd be surprised how many don't do that. Pretty much none of them do that well, and and even if they have site search, you know how crappy site search is. You can't find anything. So that yeah. is an example of where there's a feedback loop right there that you could be milking and using for. Uh, getting better insights about your customers, even if you don't get to talk to them, right? They're telling you what they're, what they need, what their missing links are. So that kind of ties back to the missing link framework, which is missing links are observable and you can act on it, right? Observable means you can see what they're searching for. You can also see what they're asking about, right? So on Amazon, they have customer questions, right? So sometimes if a person hasn't bought the product yet, they might ask a question, oh, does uh, this form a battery fit into this digital camera or something, right? They'll ask questions. So those are places where you can observe the missing links. And when you see those, then you can actually create content to answer those missing links, right? It, and then you it, can act upon it, right? So you can do marketing, you can create content, you know? So that's why missing links was designed to be practical and actionable. It's so interesting because um, I, I, I came to a very similar conclusion. One of the, there's a process that we teach uh, when it comes to bootstrappers in, uh, in YRC that's uh, different. It's a 12 week bootcamp to uh, help people increase profits. Um, and one of the things that we do is, is this process, which is called a detective and a doctor. And it's essentially this idea of you go to a clubhouse, which is a place where you think that your audience lives. Um, there's a, a certain methodology to identify those. And there you can do digital ethnography. And the idea there is that you can spy on people in their natural environment yeah. um, yeah. Be, to, to avoid these distortions, which you mentioned, where it's like, you know, you're doing research on a panel and everyone says what you want to hear. There are yeah. some interesting stories about that, by the way, when uh, I believe Philips or maybe it was Sony where they they were testing different colors of a particular product and everyone said oh we want a black one and then they they said okay um you know as a gift you can pick one and everyone chose uh, the the yellow one or something like <laughs> yes, that so yes. the, you, you have these exactly you have these these perfect things, example so so for me over the years i just said observe data is always exactly. better than survey data right what did they actually do not what they yeah. said right so yes. a lot of times you have to observe what they search for right because they don't have any incentive to trick you and then also just go on Amazon, right? What do they ask about, right? They, they don't know that you're listening, but all the data is right there. So if you took the time to actually look at that, you would find out what your customers need. Yes, one again, uh, one million percent agree because that's actually something that we do as well. You know, going through these these absolute gold mines in order to get a better understanding of what the pain yes. points are, we we actually tally. We look for we look for common themes and we tally, and then we use all of that information to form a hypothesis, a null hypothesis, and then you try and create uh, content in order to help particular uh, people, yes. and then you collect like a, a small we call it a small tribe, which is like the next step uh, from audience to a small tribe. Then you try and get those people on a list, and eventually. You can pitch them but it's a it's a, a very similar process and you can get a much better first approximation or like first draft um yeah. if, if you if you start with all of that research and if you start customer first 
versus if you start, you know, using your own brilliance and just create a product out of thin air, yeah, no yeah. idea if it actually solves a problem. And that brings yeah. us back to the point that you mentioned, which is like, there's, there's already an existing demand. Sometimes, you know, you need to invent a category or, or, you know, you need to frame it a certain way, um, but you can't make someone want something that they, that they don't want. And that's a problem that that's a, a risk that you ha uh, run into if you start with the product first, oftentimes. Yeah. Um, and I call that in my class, uh, product outward thinking, right? So very often uh, th I've seen that literally in technology innovation, they dream up a product in the lab and then they throw it over the fence to the marketing department and said, figure out how to market this, right? That's yeah. not the way it's supposed to go, right? But unfortunately, because of departmental silos, that's how it goes in big corporations. So for, for small businesses, it really needs to be further integrated and product, the product people also need to be the ones listening to the customers because then they know how to innovate the product and what features mm. they need to put in, right? And just a corollary to that is when you when you go mine these gold mines of information, um, you know, this is how like a small business, a David can overcome a Goliath, can, can outwit a, a big brand that has tons of marketing dollars, advertising dollars. Because the, if you listen to the customers and then you go create content that, that you put on your site, your social channels, whatever, that better answer is they're missing links. You're going to win the sale. Whereas mm -hmm. the big brand who has too much money than, than they know what to do with are just spending everything in ads. Okay. The David can beat the Goliath. And the other thing that I do, practically speaking, is I start running some of these marketing messages in search ads first. Basically, I, I create header copy and body copy and just see which resonates. And the way we can tell what resonates is uh, basically through click-through rates. What did people understand, right? I can have a way of saying it, but if they don't understand my way uh, or what I'm telling them, they're not going to click on it and they're not going to understand why your product fulfills that demand, their demand, right? So you can actually use search advertising, paid search, to then test these concepts, right? Test copy, right? Test the words. And then by looking at the click-through rates, then you can actually say, okay, these words resonate better. So therefore, I need to build those words into my content. So in this case, um, you know, I've even seen yeah. uh, examples where, you know, Canon can be doing TV advertising, but when the person goes online and searches for a digital camera, right, note that they're not searching for Canon digital camera. They're searching for digital camera, which is the thing that they want. They are open to what brand, right? So whichever brand is better at answering their missing links or satisfies the bits of information they need is going to actually win the sale. Right. And also yeah. if Fuji or if Sony has better reviews on Amazon, even if the person was inspired to go search by seeing a, a Canon TV ad, they're going to end up buying the Sony digital camera because Sony had better content, uh, had better reviews and uh, explained to them why it was a better product. So okay. there's a lot of that you can do, you know, to to win. OK, so would it be fair to say. Dr. Fu says, chill with the branding. <laughs> yes, w w chill with the branding. Okay. Because the branding. It, it's basically what, what the advertiser wants to say. That has nothing to do with what the customer perceives. Yeah. Right? And, and these days, customers are too smart, right? So just this one way, you know, what I meant by shouting at people, right? That's what ads are, right? You're just using a bullhorn. You're just shouting at them in their face saying, my product is awesome. My product is awesome. They don't care what you say, right? They're going to do their own research. So if you don't have everything else surrounding it, like good product reviews, other people talking about it, and not, I don't mean the fake influencers, right? There's influencers yeah. that get paid to say, oh, I'm drinking this soda or something like that. That doesn't work. Most, most people are too smart. Now, there are some young people who will buy into that for a period of time, but that's not sustainable, right? I'm talking about sustainable marketing, things you can do repeatedly that will help you drive growth. One of the things that I'm uh, wondering is um, up until this point, um, a lot of the stuff that we've been uh, talking about centers, centers around this idea of um, a very heavy customer orientation. You know, you put the customer first, you put the customer first, you put the customer first, and then you use that uh, in order to, to solve your business problems. Um, in, in your opinion, is there, is there even a case to be made for a, a company who, who embraces a uh, profit orientation where it's okay, we, we start business first and, and we use that approach in order to, uh, to run our company? No, no. Okay. if you don't start with a customer, uh, you might as well not be in business. 
Okay, let me yeah. let me put it more bluntly. Um, you start with the <laughs> Otherwise, your product's not going to be right. Your marketing's not going to be right. Nothing's going to be right. So what you see and what people think are successful would be they they always point to Silicon Valley companies. But to yeah. me, most of Silicon Valley is vaporware. Um, they've been able to just throw VC money at it and basically prop up valuations, and then you get these huge exits. It's not that they were actually successful at selling anything. So one of the, the or two categories I can cite would be the bike sharing stuff or scooter sharing, and then also the um, you know like what do you call those meal plan things? Okay, so yeah, there were there was a number of years where all these different bike sharing companies started, right? They were they all went unicorn, right? They all got to a billion dollars valuation, and in fact, in China, you know, because there's so many people, but I don't know if you've seen those pictures where there are literally mountains of discarded bikes because there was no demand. Literally, there's the demand didn't materialize, even though they paid all this money, made all the bikes, uh, thinking that, oh, all these people are going to use bike sharing in China. They, they didn't happen. So all those companies got to a billion dollar valuation and then exited. And then now you're left with mountains of bikes just piled up. OK, yeah. same thing with those, uh, you know, grocery delivery services. And it's not the right term, but, you know, like um, Blue Apron. Oh, no, no. oh, that one. Blue Apron and okay. HelloFresh. So these are where they, the meal prep things, right? Where you buy, they send you a box. The meal boxes. Yeah. yeah. Again, all, you know, many, many of those came about uh, fueled by venture capital money. They threw money at advertising. That's where some of the digital marketing went wrong because they literally, their product was undifferentiated from every other meal prep you know, thing. They just threw a yeah. whole bunch of money at TV ads, at digital ads and all that kind of stuff. And ultimately, that just inflated the quantities and, and all the kind of stuff. And ultimately, they all went away, or most of them went away, right? So I think those are just examples of where Silicon Valley is just smoke and mirrors. It's, it's not a good example of successful marketing. Yeah, uh, yeah. Well, again, I, I, I agree with you so much. Uh, oftentimes, when you're friends with someone, part of the reason why you're friends is, you know, you, you, you tend to think similar <laughs> or see the world uh, through a similar shaped lens. Um, but yeah, I 100% agree. There's there's actually one more reason why I think um, uh, the Silicon Valley entrepreneurial science, which comes from Silicon Valley, so so ways of explaining entrepreneurial uh, entrepreneurship from Silicon Valley are so dangerous for us, is because you always need to ask yourself who is giving the advice. And I think when it comes to Silicon Valley, your a, a lot of the advice comes from people who are investors, which means that they have a small piece among an entire batch. But that fundamentally changes the advice that you're going to give because you're going to optimize for the for the outcome of the entire batch yeah. because it doesn't matter to you if, if if Dr. Fu wins or RJ because you've invested in both. So if Dr. Fu blows up along with uh, uh, 500 other people, but uh, I make a big company, it doesn't matter which one of us succeeds. Yeah. But it does to us, you know. Yeah. If if, so if, if you in those cases, yeah, that was where I was trying to get to the profit orientation, right? So sometimes the yeah. product sucks and it's completely undifferentiated, but the VC still made the money, right? And sometimes yeah. the founders did get to exit. What you don't see are the uh, 99 other founders out of the 100 that failed. You see what I'm yeah. saying? So um, that equation is not indicative of real marketing, sustainable marketing uh, or good advice, right? It's just a figment yeah. that they've created. Yeah, Chamath, uh, uh, Chamath uh, Polyhapatia, he even has a stronger claim where he says that the Silicon Valley is mostly one big Ponzi scheme because everyone's propping up valuations in order to, be, because they're, they're not just, not everyone knows this, but they're not just making money when a company has an exit event. They're also making money by, by uh, getting a percentage of the, of the, the assets yeah. under management. Yeah. So, so if, you, if, you, if you can show that all of your companies are doing really well, then you can use that as a, as a correlation, wet streets yeah. cause rain. Like, look at how good these companies are doing. Yes. Surely they're, they're going to you know, have a huge IPO and we're going to be rich. But in the meantime, let me raise a little bit more money. Yes. So now they're raising more money. Yes. And off of the can... figment that they created, off of the illusion that they created. Yes, that's Pre true. Precisely, precisely. And you, and you have maybe like five partners or something, just a small amount of partners. You can you can uh, take your percentage of the assets under management. And now you can yes. live uh, like kings, mm -hmm. even if every single company go, yes. goes nowhere, essentially. Yes. Yes. So that's a huge problem. All right, uh, we got we got uh, about ten minutes left. Um, one of the things that came up was uh, differentiation. So I think uh, maybe we can have a, a, a quick little conversation about the whole uh, debate, which rears, rears it, its head on Twitter every three months or so, with uh, distinctiveness versus differentiation. What are your uh, thoughts re regarding that subject? 
Um, I'm going to go back to the example before, which is, um, and I use these examples in class. So if you think about MasterCard, Visa, American Express, okay, yeah. if your customer cannot articulate a difference, they cannot do word of mouth. They can't tell their friend, I, I say, okay, so if you think about these three credit card companies, which one would you choose? And what would you tell your friend in terms of the reason why you chose one particular credit card over another? Okay, so if Visa, MasterCard, and American Express, if you can't articulate a difference, there's nothing to tell your friend, right? So similarly, Avis, Hertz, or Budget, rental cars, or Target, Walmart, and Best Buy, or whatever the um, other company, like Kohl's or something, right? Um, so differentiation is important, but it's not fake differentiation that is conveyed or communicated through ads. People can see through that. It is real differentiation. Does your product actually work different? Does your product actually have feature differences? So I've said this in the past. Um, if you had $100 to spend and your product is undifferentiated, don't spend the $100 in marketing. Spend the $100 in R&D. Make your product better. Simple as that. So good. So good. So does this mean that you disagree with uh, Professor Sharp? Uh, because he is, uh, he, he doesn't completely knock differentiation, but he does, you know, the stronger emphasize, uh, emphasis that most um, uh, people who are in the marketing science space have on uh, distinctiveness come from uh, his work. Well, anyway, I disagree with Sharp on many things. And I basically, the reason I knock his stuff is because he's an academic. He doesn't have real world experience or enough real world experience, and he's not willing to learn. So I've had plenty of debates with him on Twitter and he always falls back to, oh, four Ps. I mean, that was why I railed against the four Ps. He was pushing yeah. that and said, oh, that solves all your problems. No, it doesn't. And not enough people actually use it in the real world. So I don't agree with Sharp on most things. And I would welcome a debate with him on everything because I just don't think he's oriented towards practicality, what a small business could actually do and learn. You know, a lot of the stuff is rooted in just academic theory. And I don't think he spent enough time thinking about practical applications. He doesn't understand digital well enough to, to know all the good stuff that, that you could actually take from digital and learn. And just like when we said, you know, there's social media, you can listen to your customers and what they said. You can go on Amazon, look at the questions they ask about a particular product. There's so many things, uh, feedback loops that exist in digital that didn't exist with one-way channels. He's 30 years out of date. <laughs> Oh boy. All right. Super interesting. Um, okay. I think a good place to wrap this up is uh, with metrics. So uh, few people know more about all of this stuff uh, measuring than, uh, than you do probably. So what are some uh, metrics that, that we need to look at that we need to keep in mind and optimize? The only thing you need to care about is outcomes. Right. So again, I'm going to put myself in the shoes of a small business. Um, so if you spend any kind of money on marketing, market research or anything, uh, if it doesn't drive outcomes like sales, you're going to die in a year. Right. So uh, the only thing that matters is outcomes. Now, there are th metrics that lead up to that, right, that can directionally tell you uh, which pay channels are better for you to use than others. Um, but a lot of times, you know, the young marketers, especially they focus on easy to measure things like clicks or page views and whatever. And again, tying this back to my study of fraud, just know that the bots can click on stuff all day long, right? So even if you got a whole bunch of clicks, um, you have to know if those are from humans or bots, because bots are not going to buy from you, humans will. So if the majority of the clicks you're getting from your paid digital programs are coming from bots and you don't know that those are not good metrics to use. Right. So long story short is you need to really focus on the outcomes and then kind of backtrack to which metrics actually map to that. OK, so clicks and page views are typically not that good. They might be directional indicators, uh, but just know that they can be easily faked. So don't just put all your trust in that one metric. And one other principle, let me just end with this, would be think about triangulating different data sets. OK, so. For example, if you're a paid program, so you're logged into Google AdWords and it tells you you have all these different clicks, the, the other data set you use to kind of corroborate that would be your own Google Analytics, right? So did those clicks actually arrive on your site? You see what I'm saying? So two entirely different data sets. The first data set is Google AdWords or maybe your Facebook ads or maybe your Twitter ads or whatever. Uh, they will report a set of clicks to you. 
I always like to find another data set that's supposed to be correlated, right? So in theory, every click that comes from AdWords or reported by AdWords should actually arrive on your site. So you should be able to see it in Google Analytics, which is a different platform, right? Um, if there are discrepancies, then you start asking questions. So the principle of that is use different data sets that um, are supposed to match, right? One click to one page view on your site. If they don't match, that allows you to troubleshoot it more, right? So just find those opportunities. The, the other thing as it applies to fraud is that it's much harder to trick both data sets correctly to make, it, to make the fraud look correct. So it's a really simple way for you to start picking out the fraud, right? If you got a lot of clicks, but those clicks didn't even cut to your site, those are not valuable yeah. anyway, right? So yeah. that's what I meant by you can actually find a lot of the fraud yourself without any specialized tools. Just spend the time looking at different data sets and then correlating them because they, they're supposed to match up. Uh, can people um, um, do a little bit of risk mitigation by saying, okay, I'm gonna uh, focus the majority of my of my budget on uh, things like Google AdWords and Facebook, and you know, make sure that uh, my ads aren't seen on uh, third party sites? Is is that yeah? Uh, I think, yeah. So I'll 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 make a very simple uh, summary. There, there's a, there's some nuance to it, but if you're gonna, so I would say first do search ads because, like I said before, when people are looking for something, that's the best time to get an ad in front of them and they told you what they're looking for. So search advertising would be the first priority uh, and make sure you turn off search partners and GDN. So make sure your ads load on Google only because that's where people search, okay? The second is if you do display ads, uh, do it on Facebook, but make sure you turn off Facebook audience network. So then again, you keep your ads on Facebook, Instagram, and WhatsApp because those are the apps that humans actually use. And I have many case studies of where Facebook advertising display ads work extremely well. So I can show you that later in separate case studies. And then finally, if you do YouTube advertising or do video ads, put them on YouTube, but instead of spraying it everywhere, just manually curate the channels that are good creators and that are reputable, right? Because if you advertise on UGC, it's gonna to go to crappy places, right? It's gonna go on channels that are inappropriate. But if you just take a whitelist approach and say, I only, I know my audience visits these few, maybe it's three, maybe it's five, maybe it's 10 channels. It doesn't need to be more than that. If you know where your audience goes or what types of videos they look at, choose those channels and use a whitelist approach. And then your ads are gonna to go to people and go to appropriate places. And that's it, right? Search ads, display ads, video ads. You're pretty much done. All right. Let me ask you one more question and uh, then we'll wrap it up. Um, you talked about the importance of content um, because content allows uh, us marketers to, to uh, solve the, the missing link issue because we can educate. Um, how should we think about doing content well? And is content important for everyone? So if you're, uh, if, if you're a company and you make pizzas, should you, should you uh, also use um, this content approach? Yeah, content has to come before any kind of advertising, right? So it comes before that fourth P, promotion, because if you do any kind of advertising and that inspires people to look for you, when they get to your site, they said, oh, well, the content sucks or there's literally no content. Uh, you're going to create a negative impression instead, right? So content is important. Now, let me clarify, the content could be a single sentence. It could be a picture. It could be something super small. Content doesn't have to be an article. doesn't even have to be a paragraph. It could be literally a question answer pair. So think about FAQs, frequently asked questions. So part of missing links is there are also frequent missing links because there's going to be a lot of people in the future that have the same question as people in the past. So if you see their question and then you took the time to take that question and a one sentence answer and just stick it somewhere, right? put it on your site, put it on your Instagram, put it wherever that now that piece of content, no matter how small it is, can pay dividends for you over time because there's going to be another potential customer in the future that has that same question that will, or same missing link that's going to be answered by the content that you've created. So you create it once and it continues to pay value to you. Whereas if you bought and bought an ad, the ad is over the second it is done yeah. airing, right? The TV ad is over. People won't remember it the moment it's done. So if you create content, if you invest that dollar in content, no matter how small a snippet of content it is, it's going to continue to pay dividends for you over time. And that's a much 
better way of investing your dollars to grow value for your business over time. Wow, I can uh, I could continue to talk with you for days, <laughs> not hours, days. This has been nothing short of amazing. This has been an, uh, a masterclass. Thank Great. you so much for your time. Thank I'm 100% sure that people are going to absolutely love this. Um, for the people who are uh, listening and um, you know want to see more and learn more about what it is that you do, um, what, what, where can we send them? Uh, I'm on Twitter. Uh, handle is A-C-F-O-U. And I'm on LinkedIn. Just find my name, Augustin Fu. Uh, and happy to chat with you, all of you. Happy to learn from you because... You know, that's how I learn. I have my own experiments, but I also hear stories from other small business owners, other marketers. Um, I'd love to learn from all of you as well. So thank you all very right. much. for Terrific. I'll make sure to include uh, all of that stuff in the description. All right. Thank all you right. so much, man. Thank you. And, uh, all right. Thanks, RJ. Talk to you later. Okay. Talk to you later. Bye.